Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to Exotic Astrology. And it's an amazing evening, day for every one of us because we have none other than the great James Braha, sir, with us. So, uh, welcome to Exotic Astrology, sir. It's been a great fortune to talk to you. We have uh, had some interviews long, long, long time back, almost yeah. years back. So, and now he's back to answer so many questions on Jyotish. And especially, uh, sir has uh, written a book. Uh, it's on sutras, which we are going to see now. And uh, that's yes, sir. So that's uh, that's the book, the Braha Sutras, as you can see. And sir said there are almost two hundred sixteen uh, topics which he has mentioned. So my only question to you, sir, is uh, what made you write a book on Jyotish at the age of seventy? Please, please share. <laughs> Yeah, uh, you know, it turns out that it would be much better if astrologers wrote their books when they're in their 60s or 70s after they've had so much experience. Instead, we write our books when we're 30 and 35. We don't know that much yet. Yes. But anyway, um, what happened was that I, I hadn't given a workshop at the Sedona conferences for 10 or 15 years, I hadn't done it. Uh, and th the reason that I hardly ever do them is because I have a neurotic tendency that when I'm supposed to give a workshop, I just worry about it so much that I overwork. I just, so when I agreed to do the workshop, I spent an entire year thinking about what I wanted to talk about, what they don't know, things that I've learned that took decades to learn. I got there, the workshop was over in a day, and then there was a, a lecture. And the, the, the topic was what I wish I knew 40 years ago. Wow. When I was done giving all these pieces of information, I realized I had, written, I had worked so hard about everything I've learned <coughs> that I realized I could take this material and write a book. And what I did in the workshop was to give them little tips of information, <clears throat> not, not putting horoscopes and doing the horoscopes, not that, but giving little tips about what happens when many planets aspect a house. What, what, is, what happens when three malefics aspect a house? What happens when two benefics aspect another benefic? Things that are very, very specific. What happens when there's a fallen planet in the seventh house from the moon. These are, there's very specific answers, but I realized that, that I could write an entire book. So I started to write the book and it was going to be called something like uh, Vedic Astrology 200 Tips. But I had, but I had, been, I had been giving some uh, Skype lessons to a student uh, to pay him back because he had done some proofreading for me. And so as I was giving him after two or three sessions, I said, are you learning anything? Are you getting this? Is it helping? He said, oh my God, I have a computer file called the Braha Sutras where I'm writing all these things. <laughs> and I said, oh my God, that's a great title. And <laughs> what makes it a great title is that instead of it just being 200 Vedic astrology tips, I could also give information that's taken a lifetime to learn about happiness, about the art of living, about relationships. Not a lot, it's 90% it's Vedic astrology, but it, it meant that I could include other subjects as well. So I said, that's a great topic. And when I began writing it, of course I was writing uh, you know, all the things that I had taught, but because I was writing you know, you, you, you want to get a certain order, you want to get a certain, uh, uh, you know, way to write it down. And so I, I, be, I began from the start, you know, what it means to actually be an astrologer, how you have to practice, you know, things like that. And, and then I wrote, you know, I had maybe 100, 120 different tips from the workshop. But every day that I wrote, I would be doing a reading. I would do my writing in the morning. And then in the afternoon, I would do a reading. The book took over a year to write. So as I was doing horoscopes five days a week, 
I would be explaining something astrological and the client would say something. I say, no, that's not how it works. And then I would realize I better put this in the book. So, you know, much of it I had already worked on, but a lot of it came during the, during the writing. Um, so, um, there, so it's 216. The reason it's 216 is because that's double the sacred number of 108 is 216. So there's 216 topics and it's divided into the being, being an astrologer, the doing, like in the doing, it would talk about, you have to use the bhava chart. You must use the bhava chart. You must find the theme of the horoscope. Um, uh, the way you analyze dharma, artha, kama, and moksha. And I would spend a page or two on all of these different features, but there's the being, the doing, and the doing is the most. There's about a hundred sutras on the doing. Then comes the nodes. There's a whole section on the Rahu and Ketu, and then the clients, and then the predictions, etc. So I will talk about some of these. Yes. So, you know, when I started astrology, I would do a horoscope, and I, I had no format. And as the years and decades would go by, it would change in time, but mainly. I didn't really have a format. Mainly, I would just jump into the reading. And if it was all about the, if the chart was all about career, I would jump in right there. If it was all about relationship, I would jump in there. As the decades went by, I came to find certain methods that work better. For example, as soon as I have the client, as soon as the client is, is, is there, I prepare them for the reading. I let them know when the questions, when they can ask questions, how long the reading will go, things like that. But I also do an overview. I say, I'm gonna do an overview of the chart for five or 10 minutes, and then I'm gonna get into the specifics. The reason that I do that is because when you do the overview, you're talking about all the things in the horoscope that are crystal clear. It's very clear that your talents are in this area. It's very clear that you have great love relationships. It's very clear that you have uh, karmic debts in career, what, whatever it is. The reason you do this is because if you do that in the first five or 10 minutes and you're very accurate, the client begins to say, oh, this astrologer knows what they're doing. And then they trust you, then they trust you. Because listen, even after 40 years, there is so much that you don't know. There is so much that you, it's just mind boggling. So I do that. Then, then the, the main structure after that is to talk about the foundation. The foundation of the horoscope is the most important area that you can address. The foundation is the ascendant, the moon and the sun. If they are all strong and powerful and not afflicted, the person has immense confidence and they go through life easily. The one problem they have is that they think they're better than they are because the confidence is so good, okay. but life is easy. Then you have someone where the ascendant is very good, the sun is very good, but the moon is very afflicted. So now it becomes mixed. There is some vulnerability of, uh, and then you have some people like myself, my moon is in the 12th house, strike one. My ascendant ruler Venus is right next to Ketu and, and 12th ruler Mars, I mean right next to them, strike two. The sun is in the 29th degree <laughs> of Virgo, right next to Libra. My foundation is, was destroyed. That foundation never ends. It never ends. And it took me a long time to understand that. So you, so in, 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 in my case, the, the going through life is a struggle, it's difficult, it's fearful, but I've managed to learn how to deal with that, how to overcome it, how to deal with it, but you never change it, it never changes. That's why I never gave conferences, I almost never gave them because I would worry about it all year, I would overwork, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So understanding the foundation is the number one most important thing for that person. And if the foundation is really bad, then you may have to work with them on how to handle those problems. Most people by the age of 40 or 50, they've started to realize 
how to how to they either go to therapy or counseling or they find methods to use on their own but that's very important um another uh, another thing that i you know came to to understand really well is why the moon is so important the moon is very important because it's a lunar based system but much more than that the moon is your nurturing in childhood. Okay. If you, if the moon is very afflicted, in the first six or seven years of life, the nurturing is so poor that the person begins to, dis, they, the, once the personality is formed, that person believes that they deserve poverty, poverty in relationships, poverty in money, whatever it is. If the moon is very strong, they know they deserve good to be treated well throughout life. This is critical. It's critical. So, you know, things like that. Um, another thing is, you know, in the first five or 10 years of doing astrology, you know, everything is, it takes so long to memorize everything. And you know, I would look at a horoscope and I would say, I would put on the side of the chart, Mars aspects, the, uh, the seventh house and Mars aspects, the person's eighth house, whatever, or, you know, Saturn is aspecting the ascendant and the third house, whatever it is. And I would write that on the side, but I never, it took me a long time to actually be able to, in my mind, put together, oh, I just noticed Saturn aspects the third house, Mars aspects the third house, and Rahu aspects the third house. Those are three malefics aspecting that house. If you don't see them all together, you miss the horoscope. Yeah. If, if you're talking about the horoscope and you say, oh, look, Mars is aspecting the third, it means this. And then 10 minutes later, oh, look, Saturn's aspecting, it means this. That's not, that's not the way it works. Now, the malefics aspecting the third house, they are aspecting an upachaya house, which can use malefic energy. So the third house is gonna be okay for mechanical, technical skills, for willpower, but it's gonna be devastating to younger siblings. Okay. So people don't understand that with upachaya houses, they think if Saturn and Mars are in the 11th house, it's great. Yes, it's great for large sums of money, uh, but it is not good for the eldest sibling. So you have to understand these are little subtleties, but they need to be understood. On the other hand, if Jupiter, Venus, and Moon are aspecting the 10th house without a lot of malefics aspecting the 10th, the career is going to be phenomenally successful. Okay. But you have to be able to see them all at once. Okay. All, all, all at once. Another thing, here's something that took 30 years to cut to for me to realize. And this is why you wanna get books written by astrologers that have been in the field a long time because uh, it, it, it took about 20, 30 years to find out that some people who have a bunch of benefics together, you know, in the beginning days, you say, oh my God, look at this, Jupiter, Venus, and Moon are all in the same house conjunct, this is fantastic. You come to find out a certain portion of these people do not accomplish much. And you're doing their horoscope reading and you're saying this house is so great and you have these enormous talents and this is fantastic. And then they say to you, I got to get off my butt and make it happen. And you go, what? Yeah. You haven't made that happen yet? No. Why? Because when you have benefics without malefics interfering, you have benefics and they're really prominent. They're really, maybe they're in the first house. They don't have to be in the first house if they're aspecting each other without yeah. malefics in their conjunct. They're actually feeling very good inside. Venus is on the ascent. I feel good. I don't feel any urgency. I don't have to work hard. And so you have a certain number of people that are lazy and you cannot blame them for being lazy because it's their karma that they feel good. They feel good all the time. Okay. So when I do a horoscope where I see a lot of benefics together in some prominent placement, I immediately look to see, is there any struggle? 
Are there any difficult planets? Are there any houses that are very afflicted? You need to have some of that. Otherwise, there's no struggle, there's no urgency, and they're lazy. So that's what the book is like. It's all about all these different kinds of, 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 of elements. Another one is words jump. This is one of the sutras. There's 216 sutras. One of them is words jump out of the mouth. So you're doing a reading. You're doing a reading and everything is sounding good. And all of a sudden you blurt out something that you wish you hadn't blurted out. It happens to everyone. It, it's a live, it's like being on television live. It happens to everyone. Now, another one of the sutras is you must be confident and you must be humble. You must have extreme confidence because you prepared well, but you must be humble. You must be humble to always be looking for when you make mistakes, okay? So in the case, so that means the humility is to stop and say, wait a minute, that what I just said, let me take that back. It doesn't feel good to say that, but it's necessary yeah. to get the reading proper. The advice, uh, the advice also, there's another sutra. Um, well, no, this is the sutra about words jump out of the mouth. So a lot of times you may say something that's too negative. Yes. or too extreme. People say, oh, you should never be a writer. Oh, you should never have children. Something that's just too extreme, yes. right? So what I advise in the sutra is to be like a policeman or a policewoman. A policeman or a policewoman, where do you think their attention is always present? They have in their peripheral vision no matter what they're doing, no matter what they're saying, they are always aware of their weapon. Yes. They can be doing anything that they're doing. They always know where their weapon is. So the astrologer needs to have a certain vision. Whenever they're doing the reading, they're saying everything they're saying, they have to have a certain vision of when I say something that's too extreme. And so if they have that peripheral vision, always on the lookout for saying something wrong or too extreme, then as soon as they make the, as soon as they make the extreme statement, a thought comes into the mind, uh-oh, did I just misuse astrology? Did I just set, did I just set this client up for something that's going to hurt their life? So this is, so that's one of the sutras. Another one is I get so many clients who think that if Rahu's in the first house, it aspects the seventh. This is ridiculous. Because if, if Ketu is in the seventh house, the partner is going to be Ketu-like. Yes. They can't be Ketu-like and Rahu-like. It makes yeah, no sense. Correct, 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 correct. So that's a sutra. And I can't tell you how often people believe that. Another one. This comes from knowing Western astrology. Now, when you read this book, you're going to see, and by the way, you can get the book on ebook. If you're in India, it's much cheaper in ebook on Google Play, Google Play, Apple Books, Barnes and Noble. Over here, we get it from Amazon. The hard, co the hard copy or the paperback is at Amazon. So in that, in that book, I talk about my, my ninth house, the house of higher knowledge is so enormously strong. The ninth ruler Saturn is, is a Raja Yoga Karaka, it rules the ninth and tenth. It's in the fifth, Purva Punya, and it's aspected within minutes, within 14 minutes by Jupiter. Whenever I've wanted higher knowledge, I always get it, I always get it. And so I say this to tell you how lucky I have been finding the right teachers. My luck has been enormous, but the greatest luck of all was that I studied Western astrology for five years before learning Jyotish. I use both systems. I focus mainly on the Hindu because it's predictive, but I also use the Western. And that's the greatest blessing of my entire life. And I've had so many on the spiritual level. I got no luck in my childhood. I got no luck in the foundation of the horoscope. But when it comes to higher knowledge, it just comes immediately. So. 
one of the things that I can tell you that is so important to understand is that in the Western system, so you have Rahu and Ketu, in the Western, they're known as the North Node and the South Node. So in the Western chart, the South Node tells us what we did in past lives. And the North Node, the exact opposite, tells us what we're supposed to develop in this life. Yes. So if the South Node is in the fourth house, we've already learned about home and family, North Node's in the 10th, now we go toward career. And it becomes fairly easy to go toward career because the North Node is there. Yes. Now, any planet that is within five or 10 degrees of that North Node, and maybe even more, maybe 15, but any planet next to the North Node is going to be incredibly easy to access. Okay. For example, for example, if Venus is within five or 10 degrees of that North Node, in the Western system, we're going toward that North Node. So if we decide, if we decide to go toward Venus, I think I want to do the arts. I think I want to work with sweets. I think I want to work with jewelry. Anything Venusian is going to be successful so easily because okay. it's natural to go to the North Node. Yes. See? It does not mean that the person will go toward Venus. It doesn't mean that. It yes. means if they do, it'll succeed like that. Okay. If they have okay. Jupiter near the North Node and they decide to be a spiritual teacher or an astrologer, it'll be like that. Okay. If they have Saturn near the North Node, Saturn's going to hurt that North Node and you're going to have a bad uh, Rahu Dasha because of Saturn. Okay. But if Saturn's near that North Node and you go towards carpentry or real estate, it's going to be easy. If oh, Mars okay. is near the North Node and you want to be a policeman or military or computers mechanical, it's going to be easy. It doesn't mean that you will. It means if you do. This is, you can, you can go to sleep, you can go to the bank on what I'm telling you, because I'm telling you things that took 40 years to learn. Some of the people that are buying this book, they're writing on Amazon, they're writing reviews, and they're saying, oh my God, he just saved me 10 years of hard work by telling me his experience. So that's what it is. So um, here's another one. This is remarkable. And some of these sutras, some of these sutras came, you know, easily when I was uh, you know, just thinking about what I wanted to teach in the, in the conference. But some of them didn't come easily. Some of them came during the writing. You know, I would, I would start to think about something. And here's one of them that came like that. Out of all the planets, the one that is the most affected in a positive or negative way is Rahu. Mm -hmm. So... I mean, Mercury is, is very sensitive and it gets affected by anything. But what I mean is this. If you put Saturn in the second house, it's usually bad for money. Assuming it's not well aspected, it's usually bad for money. And then you have Venus or Jupiter aspecting that Saturn in the second house. It doesn't usually mean that the person becomes very wealthy. It means that the Venus or Jupiter lessens, it, it makes less destruction of Saturn, okay? There are cases where if Jupiter or Venus is aspecting Saturn within minutes, it might, it might be very positive. But most of the time, it just makes it less bad. If you put yeah. Saturn, if you put Saturn in the seventh house, it's very bad for relationship. If Venus or Jupiter aspect it, it makes it less bad. Okay. But if you put Rahu in the seventh house, aspected by Venus or Jupiter, suddenly the Rahu becomes, Rahu is characterized by insatiable cravings and desires for worldly power. Yes. So when Rahu gets aspected in the seventh by Venus or Jupiter, suddenly the partner is extremely successful. Okay. If you put Rahu in the money house and you have it aspected by Venus or Jupiter, it doesn't make it less bad. It makes it phenomenally powerful. Okay. So this is a really important thing to understand because 
the superstition, and I have several sutras in the book about don't fall for the superstition of Rahu and Ketu. Just because it's the head and tail of a demon does not make it all bad. Ketu is metaphysical and psychic and spiritual. Rahu is worldly power. If Rahu's in the first house, the person is beautiful, good appearance, charisma. If, if, if Rahu's in the fifth house, the child may be very powerful. So the, the um, you know, these, these, these features of, of Rahu and Ketu, you really must understand them properly. Yes, they are the head and, head and tail of a demon and they can cause problems if they're in bad houses. And especially planets near Ketu can, can be very, very harmed. Whereas planets next to Rahu are not so harmed. So Ketu is everything psychic and metaphysical and spiritual and astral and otherworldly. That's the positive. If you didn't have Ketu, you wouldn't have astrologers and metaphysics, metaphysicians and the eighth house, you know. Uh, and then Rahu is power. So another thing is my teachers did not tell me to use the, the they did not tell me to use the aspects of Rahu and Ketu. After about three or four years, I started to notice that if a, if a house was aspected by one malefic plus Rahu or Ketu, that house was devastated. I said, these aspects must be working. So I started working, I started using the aspects of Rahu and Ketu aspecting the fifth house and the ninth house from themselves, okay? You must use those aspects, they are critical. And, but, but you have to understand, if Rahu aspects the second house, it's not all bad. That, that gives cravings and desires for power connected to money. If it's Rahu aspecting the career house, which can use malefic energy anyway, because it's an upachaya. Right. If Rahu aspects the 10th house, the career gets bigger, more powerful. Okay. If, if Rahu you know, aspects the seventh house, it's not good for marriage, but it could make the partner powerful because that's what Rahu is. If Ketu aspects, I see this all the time. I see Ketu aspecting the moon or Mercury tightly. That person's going to have introspection, spiritual, metaphysics, but they're going to be shy. It's going to cause some damage. I mean, all of these things. Another sutra in the book, uh, what was this? Uh, let's see. I forgot what I was going to say. Um, oh, yeah. So Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto. So there is a sutra in the book that says, look for signatures in the horoscope. A signature, a signature means one aspect of the horoscope that is incredibly uh, dramatic. Okay. So this could be anything. It could be that there's four planets in the second house. It's a signature. It's telling you that the money, the area of money is going to be very intense. Or you could right. see Jup or you could see Jupiter in the same degree as the moon. It's such a strong emphasis on positive energy. It becomes a signature. It's like it dominates the horoscope. Okay. Now, okay. when I, I have several sutras about using learning Western astrology along with Hindu. Okay. The, for example, I have horoscopes where I'm looking at the horoscope and there's a lot of this and there's a lot of that. And there's a signature with one of the outer planets. Neptune is sitting right on the ascendant. It dominates the horoscope. It makes them spiritual. It makes them spaced out. It makes them mystical. It makes them have no confidence, but it's dominating the chart because it's in the same degree as the ascendant. And maybe there aren't other signatures. So I start to talk about that. And then they'll say to me, I've had five different Hindu astrology readings. Nobody's ever talked about that part of my life. So if you don't know, even if you don't learn the entire system of Western astrology, if you simply learn Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto, it makes a huge difference. Now, yes. why don't they, why don't people learn both systems? 
this is so absurd. <laughs> and I have been trying to get people for 40 years to learn both systems. It goes in one ear and out the other. Why it goes in one ear and out the other is this. Well, I haven't perfected the Hindu system yet, so I can't start that one. Oh, okay. <laughs> you could be 90 years old and you haven't perfected the Hindu system. It's impossible yes. because astrology never stops. Yes. So correct. you need to be practical. And here's the thing. If you have learned the basics of the Hindu system, you don't need all of those extraneous hard to figure out techniques and subtle if you the people that are the most accurate are the ones that know the fundamentals it's the fundamentals that 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 work the best when you even when you look at yogas the yogas in my opinion they work if you're very psychic if you're very psychic like the most indians are extremely intuitive and occasionally both of my mentors would say something they, they would bring up some yoga, Lakshmi yoga. And I say, yes, she's wealthy and it doesn't, I could never see where the wealth comes from. Lakshmi yoga, she has a planet in the second, sixth, eighth and 12th house. But I tell you what, if you think that that yoga is going to make everybody yeah. that has that yoga wealthy, you're wrong. Okay. But the Indian astrologers, they're intuitive. And there were many times when I was in India in 1982 and 1984, when my mentors would say something very accurate, and I'd say, where are you getting that? And they would, they would say something astrological, and I'd say, no, it doesn't, it doesn't pass the test. They, they, they're getting it intuitively. Not all the time, not all the time. I had great teachers, but occasionally they would, they would get it that way. So anyway, so the point is, if you do get the basics, or even if you get Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto, you're going to know so much more about this horoscope. Then I have, I have a whole section on the upayas. Don't tell people that wearing a gemstone is gonna fix their marriage. Yes. It's not gonna fix their marriage. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, I talk about how to prescribe yagyas. I, I, you know, I had a Brigu reading in 1996. And recently, I live on Mount Soma now, where there's a Vedic temple a thousand feet from where I live. Okay. And I, I, had, I was going through some old papers and I found my Brigu reading from 1996. And I remembered that, you know, one person translated it and they said I would have a Sanstha, which was an orphanage. And I said this to an Indian, he said, a Sanstha is not an orphanage, it's an organization like a Jyotish organization. So I had this thought to take the, my Brigu, written Brigu over to Lakshmi, the pundit's wife. So she starts to read it. And do you know, there were things in there that they never told me. The, Lakshmi said, it says you'll live to 80. I said, what? I said, read that again. She says, he will live 80 years. They didn't tell me that. Okay. They said, listen to this one. This is another one. As you know, it's a long reading. It said I would be an astrologer. I would write astrology books, etc. I would have one son. It gave the details of my divorce, but they didn't interpret everything. She said, <laughs> she's reading it and she says, he will be connected to a Dharmastan. Uh, no, he'll be living at a Dharmastan, but will not be connected to it. Okay. I live at Mount Soma. I, I, I beg to interrupt you because this recording is going to stop now. <laughs> I don't want to cut it in between. So uh, we, we will reconnect again, sir. Okay. Okay. Thank you, sir.